Hello, my friends. Thank you for joining me again at the Poonlaw Coffee Table. You know, so get a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and get comfortable so we can continue our conversation. And if I say anything that you think is wisdom, then it's probably from God. All the nonsense is coming from me, and I apologize for that. I'm just a human like you. You know, I don't have any special revelation. I'm not claiming one. You know, I just want to share my thoughts on a topic that's been hot, a lot of conversation in recent years. Uh, today we're going to be finishing our discussion on the Great Escape, or what is most commonly called the pre-trib rapture doctrine. And I've been talking about why this doctrine troubles me so much. And so I want to recap the first seven reasons that we've talked about in the previous sessions. So number one is this doctrine makes me really sad. And that's because if we're gone, that is if the church is raptured prior to the tribulation, who will be shepherding the new believers during the tribulation period? You know, it really made me sad when I thought about it. And number two, you know, why is the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ in the Bible? You know, if the church is gone prior to the tribulation, then what's the purpose of this book of revelation being an encouragement to the church. It's what it says it's going to be. Encouraging us for what? And then number three, you know, how many second comings are there? You know, I believe in one second coming. You know, but if you're a pre-trib rapture believer, it requires Jesus to come once for the rapture and then three and a half years later come for his triumphant second return when he defeats evil and begins his reign on earth. Now, number four is how many mass resurrections will there be? Now, I believe in a first resurrection for believers to glory and a second resurrection for unbelievers to damnation. You know, the pre-trib rapture doctrine requires another resurrection, one at the rapture, and then there'll be a, the first resurrection, which is talked about in Revelation 20, which is after the tribulation period. And then number five is who are the revelation martyrs? You know, these must be believers. They have to be Christians. That's why they're being discussed. They're martyrs for Christ. But if we're raptured, then where are they coming from? You know, how are they getting such strong faith so they, they can be martyred for Christ? And there's a lot of them, all right? And then number six, you know, what's the origin of the pre-trib rapture doctrine? Now, this is contested. And I've only shared with you what my research has been, but the pre-trib rapture appears to be a modern doctrine. Uh, dispensationalism appears to be the modern concept by Darby. Uh, it was first preached about in the late to mid-1800s, about 1857 is what historical records say. And we can't track this doctrine back to early church fathers. And in fact, there's a reason for that. It wouldn't have been their focus. Their focus was preparing Christians for the world. You know, preparation and engagement, you know, trying to follow Christ and be more and more like Christ. And this doctrine doesn't really help us do that. Number seven, the pre-trib rapture doctrine appears to be a Western concept. You don't find it in the other Christian churches that originated from the first century, you know, the Orthodox churches. Uh, the concept is not very popular in places where Christians are being persecuted today. You know, the concept is, of the great escape is not very encouraging to people that are being killed for Christ right now. You know, that the people in end times are going to avoid the troubles that they're already seeing. So let's pick up our conversation where we were with my last reason, which is the rapture scriptures themselves. My reason number eight the rapture scriptures. And the, there's four primary scriptures that everybody agrees in this conversation and discussion are the, the rapture scriptures. Uh, Matthew 24, 29 to 31, which we talked about last time. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 53, which we talked about last time. And then we're going to talk about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 12. So these are the rapture scriptures. And we looked at, again, Matthew 24 and 1 Corinthians 15 in part four. And if you didn't see part four of the series, please go back and look at it. But today we're going to finish by looking at First and Second Thessalonians. We're going to do them in that order. 
So I'm going to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And again, I'm reading from the New King James Version for this study. Uh, there's no real reason. It's not a particular uh, language. It's just, it's a little easier to understand than King James, and it's a modern translation for those of you that like modern translations. So picking it up in verse 13, and in my Bible, it has a heading. It says, the comfort of Christ's coming. So we're going to be talking about Christ's second coming, right? But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus dies and rose again, even so God will bring him those who fell asleep in Jesus. So remember, in these verses, Paul is using sleep as a metaphor for death. It's common in a lot of his writings and in the New Testament. So someone who has fallen asleep means that it's just someone that's died. So let's go ahead and we're going to continue with verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So Paul is telling us that believers who are dead already are going to be resurrected first before we who are still alive are going to get our heavenly bodies. So at the rapture, the dead will rise first, and then those of us that are still alive will have our bodies changed. So let's go ahead and let's continue with verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So Paul is telling how Jesus is going to come. It sounds like a major event to me. I don't think anyone's going to be able to miss this shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Those things sound like they're going to be loud and they're going to be noticed. And it, it sounds a lot like what we see in the parallel in Revelation. And if you don't mind, I'd like to cut over to Revelation 19 and read the parallel. So... Revelation 19, 11 through 17. I'm going to read the whole scripture and then we'll, we'll talk about it. But keep in mind what we just heard in 1 Thessalonians. And in my Bible, the heading for this section is Christ on the white horse. This is the triumphant return of Christ. Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on him him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He, had, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God, and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he would strike the nations, and he himself will rule will rule them with an iron with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. So, you know, I believe this is a parallel for what we're reading in First Thessalonians. So I can't prove it. You know, I'm not a theologian, but you just read them together and see what you think. You know, I'll leave it up to you to evaluate whether what we're talking about in First Thessalonians is the second coming of Christ talked about in Revelation. You know, I believe Paul is referencing the same triumphant event. It's announced with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet. Uh, those are very, very similar. They're big events. Everybody's going to notice. So let's go ahead and we'll continue reading in 1 Thessalonians. Now with 
verses uh, 17 and 18 to finish this stretch. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Now, verse 17 is definitely the rapture. This is the one place in the Bible that it's really clear. This is what the word means. Rapture, to be caught up in the air. Caught up in the air to meet the Lord Jesus in the clouds. But when does it take place? That's the real question. And I, I think we need to understand Paul's letter in conjunction with the other verses that we've read in Matthew and Revelation. Now, I believe Paul is talking about the same triumphant second coming of Christ, and I don't see anything in the scripture to see that it would be a second one. So, let's go ahead and conclude our study by reading 2 Thessalonians, verses 1 through 12. This again, this is the last of the rapture scriptures, and I am going to uh, just read the first couple of verses. You know, and before we start, I think we, we need to remember Paul's purpose in writing 2 Thessalonians. If you have a Bible that has, you know, headings in them, at the beginning of chapter 2, right before these verses, it says the great apostasy or the great falling away in some other Bibles. You know, Paul is not intending to focus on the rapture in these texts. He's got something else in mind. He's worried about believers falling away from the faith. So let's go ahead and read. And again, I'm just going to read the first couple verses. So, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ has already come. So when Paul wrote this, there were some people talking about that the rapture had already taken place, right? So, uh, you know, Paul again is referring to the gathering, and I think he's actually referring to the rapture, even though the rapture terminology is not used in these verses. It, it, I think you have to assume that the Thessalonians have read the first letter, first Thessalonians, and have that in mind uh, when they're reading this so that it's an add-on you got to read things in context so let's go ahead and read read on with verse 3 let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed that son of perdition so paul is laying out a timeline again you know paul says don't be deceived. That day is not going to come until what? Two things. The man of sin is revealed and the great falling, falling away takes place. So that day has to refer to the gathering in verse 1. I mean, they're, that's just one verse apart, right? So the rapture must happen after the great falling away and after the man of perdition, the man of sin is revealed. That's the Antichrist. Now, if you read Revelation, uh, the tribulation will have already started when the man of perdition is revealed. So let's continue with verse 4 and see what the Bible tells us. And I'm going to continue all the way to verse 8. Who opposes and exalts himself? Then we're talking about the son of perdition, right? Who opposes and exalts himself above all? that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now again, this is the Antichrist, right? Do, not, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So Paul's reminding them of conversations they've had. And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who is now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume 
with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So there's awful lot in this little stretch of scripture. I mean, Paul is referencing the triumphant return of Jesus Christ at the end when he talks about that the Lord will consume him with the breath of his mouth. This is the same analogy we hear with the two-edged sword in a in Revelation. But more importantly, he's saying that this is going to happen in a certain sequence. Now, I've heard people say that the restraining, what's restraining the Antichrist is a church, and we're going to be raptured out, and that restraint's going to go away, and then he's going to be revealed. But that's not what these scriptures say. These scriptures say that the son of perdition has to be revealed before we're gathered. So it can't be the church being raptured that takes away the restraint. It just can't. That's not what it says. Uh, there's a lot of people going to argue about this. Read it for what it says and, and then make your own judgment. So let's continue with verses 9 through 12. The coming of the lawless one is according to the workings of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in the unrighteous or unrighteousness. So, verse 11 is, is a little scary if, if you think about it. You know, it's another reference to the deceptions that people are going to have in the end times. You know, God is going to give them strong delusion. You know, so they will continue to be believe the lie that they've been believing. Uh, basically, he's not forcing them to believe the way they do. He's just not going to affect their will. They've made their choice. And so he's going to give them strong delusion. So that it doesn't matter what happens, they're going to still believe it. And I'll suggest that we should look at an additional couple of scriptures. And I, I want to look in Revelation. In uh, Revelation 1 verse 7. Just to kind of put things in context. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. So, Revelation 1 is definitely talking about the second coming of Jesus, that everyone on earth is going to know, they're going to mourn, it's not going to be hidden. This is the triumphant return to earth. You know, I'm going to conclude by reading Revelation 22, verses 18, uh, 18 to 19. So this is the end of Revelation. And this is what, in my Bible, the heading is a warning. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy in this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to them the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Well, I think we need to take Jesus's warning seriously. You know, these are very grave consequences, and I, for one, want to make sure that I revere Jesus's words in his revelation. I don't want to teach anything that might be in conflict with the message of revelation. Jesus meant revelation to be an encouragement to the church. It's meant to be an encouragement to me. You know, he wanted us to be prepared for the trouble that is coming, the coming tribulations. He wanted us to be ready. You know, Revelation and the Gospels are messages of preparation for engagement, uh, not escape. So, again, I'm not trying to sway your opinions on this doctrine. 
Like I said, this is not about salvation. It's not about living in the kingdom of God. It's truly a gray area, and it's not worth fighting about. But while I was in the hospital, having many conversations with God, I felt so saddened when I thought about this doctrine, the pre-trib rapture. I felt sad because it does not appear to be in line with what Jesus is trying to have us do and learn in the Bible. I'm willing to die for Christ. I know new believers faced by trials need more mature believers. You know, it, they need someone that's been there before to help them. You know, the wor world's just going to eat them up. I mean, you can reference the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, verses 3 through 9, where Jesus talks about this. You know, we need shepherds. We need friends. We need community to strengthen us against the world as we follow Christ. You cannot follow Christ sitting down. Being a follower of Christ is work. It's not easy. And, and follow is an action word. It requires us to do something. Or we're not following. I mean, if you're not doing anything, you're not following. It's not just a mental exercise. It's an action. Now, I, I, I fear, and I, this, is, this is the Christian engineer talking, that theology and others like it, this theology, this doctrine, are encouraging Christians to be complacent. You know, we're kind of taught, don't rock the boat. Uh, you know, don't engage and we can get through and then God's going to rescue us from harm or he's going to protect us from harm. And in the end, when the end comes, we'll be part of the great escape and we won't have to face the trials and tribulations. You know, and the question is, you know, what if the great tribulation comes and the great escape doesn't? You know, are we preparing Christians for the troubles and trials and persecution that are coming? You know, are we preparing Christians to fail that test when it comes? You know, if the great escape happens, it's great. You know, uh, but we should still be, even if you believe in the preacher of rapture, we should still be focused on preparation and engagement until that end comes. You know, not the rescue from our troubles. You know, it's just the wrong message. You know, now this is just my opinion, and I, I apologize, but whether I'm right or wrong, it just seems that this doctrine does not help to build Christians. It does not help me to follow Christ and do what he's asking me to do. It does not encourage me to engage the world in ways that might result in me losing my comfort or even my life, my liberties, my freedoms. Just think about it. You know, I'm not saying I'm right or wrong, only that we should be focused on the big thing, not this. We should be focused on Christ and what, what Christ wants us to do. And I'll leave your opinion on this topic up to you. But there are a lot of gray area doctrines that are talked about. If it's not helping us reach people for Christ, it's not helping us grow and become more and more like Jesus, it's okay to talk about but it shouldn't be our focus. We shouldn't argue about them. And in fact, I don't even think we should dwell on them because they, they have no impact on the thing that's most important, which is building a relationship with Jesus. So I'm going to close with a prayer today. And then I'm going to share with you some links that I think were just amazingly powerful that I found during my, my study. So again, I, I really appreciated everybody coming and listening to me as we talked about, you know, just some things that really troubled me about these gray area doctrines. And it really would be general and it doesn't have to be the great escape. There are a lot of other ones. And we may talk about some of those on a later date. So can you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord God, thank you for your revelation to encourage us to be prepared and engage. I know only you know the truth about these future events, and I trust you, Lord. I pray for those that teach, and for myself, that we may not use ideas or hypotheses that violate your warning in this book of Revelation. Be merciful, Father, and guide my words and my speech so that they might be in line with your will and your words. May my words be from you, Father, 
And I pray all these things to you, Lord, in your name, Jesus. Amen. So I'd like to share just a couple links with you before I I leave for today. And, and these, these were some ones that I just found amazing. If you have not seen the documentary Before the Wrath, I, I'll attach a link to the trailer. It's not really about what you think it's about, uh, but it, it uh, talks about the Galilean wedding and the and the the symbology that Jesus is using. And you need to understand he was a Galilean. He was speaking to Galileans, and he's talking about marriage a lot in the New Testament. And it gives you a fuller, richer understanding of of what he means and what the people listening would have thought. There's also a lecture called the Galilean wedding. It's a picture of the end of the world. I'll it's a YouTube video you can see, and then I'm going to add a, a video. Uh, Mercy Me, you know, a song we probably all know, I Can Only Imagine. It's kind of gotten old, and people don't always pay attention to it, but it really, it brings to bear what our focus really should be, uh, and, and the fact that God made a sacrifice for us, and that we're asked to to build a relationship with him while we're here and help others do so. It's not just about us. It's about him. Uh, we're not the most important in the story. So check out these links. And I really appreciate appreciated you guys joining me today. And if you like the message, press like. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, I'd really appreciate it if you did. It really helps our ministry. And you can leave comments here on our website. Or you can email me directly. I want your feedback. Again, I wasn't trying to influence anybody with my opinions, and I'm sorry if it appeared that I was, but I think we need to keep our focus on the main thing, which is Jesus. So, until next time at the Punlo Coffee Table, God bless. <laughs>